Hello and welcome to another one of my watch reviews. Um, my name is John or Anthony. You may know my account is Marquise Malaspina and the review I'm about to bring you is one that I am beyond excited to be sharing. It's of a watch near and dear to my heart, one that uh, literally just showed up today and one that I've been waiting for years and years and years to acquire. Um, every time I've been into an authorized dealer or pre-owned dealer for the last several years I would always ask if this watch was in stock. The answer was always no and uh, I would also judge their reaction to see just how much they really knew about Rolexes because those that consider themselves to be really into Rolex culture and collectors of the brand will recognize this watch instantly as one that is very high in demand and one that is very hard to find. I've heard of people on wait lists for as long as nine years at times to pick up one of these watches and I believe right now it's still about two or three years to pick up this watch. Um, the watch in which I'm referring to is model number internal to Rolex 116520. You may also know it as the stainless steel Rolex Daytona. And uh, the emblem you are staring at now is the very top of the box. The box that my P series one came in and that P series designates this as a 2000 model year. So without haste, let's take a look. So we'll start with the basic Rolex green box and uh, lose this little cardboard cover here. And inside we have this gorgeous wood box. Uh, let's go ahead and get it out. And if we zoom in on this box light on it. You can see that it's a beautiful, beautiful box. <laughs> Which it should be, based on the cost of the watch, but there's even this like a uh, little bit of an inlay that goes around. Um, it's kind of hard to see on camera because it's a very faint line, but it's got this little bit of like a gold bar inlay going around it. It's a very cool box. Um, very hard to show on camera as it's very reflective and very well polished. <laughs> but uh, Presentation says a lot, and uh, I wish you could be here to see this. It's it's gorgeous. Um, and when you open that box up, um, inside on the back, there's a gold plaque that says Rolex on it. It's screwed in. It's gorgeous. And uh, but that's just a box, and we're here to see a watch. So first thing I'll take out of here is the uh, instruction catalog. Unfortunately, the one that I have is in French, and while I'd love to speak French, I don't. So I have absolutely no idea what all it says in here. But you get a nice picture of uh, Rolex headquarters, and you know, it goes through uh, the functions of the watch. It's all in a language I can't understand, but uh, I'm sure it's very informative nonetheless. And uh, there's the beautiful 4130 movement. Um, those of you that are really into Rolexes and collecting them will know that this is the in-house movement that replaced the Zenith movement, um, I believe for model year 2000. Prior to that they had the 4030 movement which was based on the Zenith El Primero movement which many considered at the time to be the most advanced, albeit one of the older uh, chronograph movements in the world. Uh, this is Rolex's first in-house movement in the Daytona, again it's called designation 4130 and that is what's about to power that is what powers the watch you're about to see. Um, unfortunately I don't have a case back opener or I'd show you mine in person. Um, nice little book, but again just a book, not the watch. So uh, here's our little Rolex dust cloth and uh, you do need this for this watch as it shows fingerprints like crazy. And uh, underneath that dust cloth is the watch itself. So, uh, and here's the uh, little hand tag that comes with Rolexes. And uh, it's holographic, as you can potentially see. Um, cool. And uh, very synonymous with the brand. Anyway, well, let's take a look at the watch. Um, again, this is the stainless steel model. Um, there is one in white gold 18 karat that looks almost identical to it. The only difference on that watch, from a visual perspective, is it's got red hands on it, I believe. Um, and, uh, here she is. 
absolutely gorgeous and um, this is on the bracelet with the newer clasp style um, all the bracelets used to have the uh, fold over with the cheap stamped clasp this one has that uh, a new gorgeous design I love this this is if any of you are familiar with watches made by Rolex prior to about 2000 or so or even so about 2006 or 2007 are familiar with their old stamped fold over clasp you can see it on my Submariner and Datejust videos this is such a nicer clasp it's finally something befitting a watch of this caliber um, and you can, you can take a look at the print on the inside of it here assuming I can get it to focus no, oh, perhaps not. There we go. Rolex Geneva, Swiss made, steel and ox. Um, and steel and ox is referring to the stainless steel that they use, which if uh, you're familiar with Rolex, they use a surgical grade. Um, and it's actually a special version that's uh, non-allergenic, I believe as well. Um, another one of their beautiful uh, oyster style bracelets. Um, the other one that's most familiar with to people that are familiar with Rolex would be the Jubilee, which you can see on my date just video. Um, I'm a much bigger fan of this bracelet than the Jubilee. It's gorgeous, highly polished. All the links, the center links are beautifully polished, which I'm sure are going to accumulate a ton of scratches because of it, but uh, it's gorgeous. And then um, let's take a look at the dial itself again here. So the Daytona, again, um, or not again, excuse me, refers to the race Daytona, which the watch is actually named after 24 hours of Daytona. And it's in reference to that because as a chronograph, this was used or could be used. I don't know if anybody's actually tried. Um, well, I'm sure Paul Newman wore one of those Daytonas, actually, the early ones. Um, it was used to elapse times on races around the track. And the way you can run the chronograph is by unscrewing these pushers. And it's very typical on that the top one. We'll start the chronograph. And stop it. Then the bottom one resets it. And um, again, you can keep track of time. And the countermeasures for it are, you have a 30 minute counter here. And every 30 minutes this resets. And then over here you have your elapsed time of up to 12 hours. So you can track up to a 12 hour race. And there's some sort of a conversion for units per hour here and if somebody wants to leave me a comment on how to use it I'd be glad to hear it. I unfortunately don't know how to use it. Um, I don't know that I'll be using the chronograph that much either that often anyway to be honest with you but it's just from a complications perspective I just love you know the workmanship that has to go into creating a good chronograph movement. Um, you can see the crown with the three dots below it. This unit has a trip lock crown um, and some of you may have picked up the reason these pushers are screwed down is for actually water tightness, I believe. Um, and then if you unscrew the crown, being that it's a trip lock and it's watertight, you, you'll see a little black O-ring right there for water tightness. That helps keep the watch watertight. Um, you can manually wind the watch, however it does have an automatic rotor. Um, and this one um, versus the Zenith one actually has a hacking movement. Uh, also known as if you pull the crown out, all the way, you'll see that the second hand down at 6 o'clock stopped. Uh, the earlier Zenith movements, it's my understanding, did not have a hacking movement, so you cannot stop the second hand counter. Um, another difference uh, between this and the Zenith movement watches is that the 60 second counter is actually down at 6 o'clock. Zenith movements, it's over at 9 o'clock. So they've actually juggled the dial around a little bit. And we can uh, Zoom in up here. Yep. Rolex Oyster Perpetual Superlative Chronometer Officially Certified Cosmograph. So the official um, Rolex terminology for this model is the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona. And you can see it says in beautiful red lettering Daytona on the dial right above the uh, second counter. I apologize this camera is going in and out of focus. Um, but there it is. And that red lettering right above the 60 second count. Um, this unit has a, uh, a sapphire crystal, and uh, you can just see the way the light bounces off that dial. It's just gorgeous. And then 
it's kind of it's I don't think I can show it on camera but if you were to look down at six o'clock there is a little bit of a etched in Rolex crown in the sapphire which Rolex has been doing on models since about 2000 or so I believe but I don't think I'm going to be able to show you that on the watch itself this watch visually hasn't really changed much since it came out I believe in about 1988 other than the movement um, you know the location of the dials on the movement changed and there's some different touches they've done versus polishing uh, and brushed finishes on the watch. Um, I believe on the Zenith this was a brushed look and it's polished on this watch. This watch is a, as you can probably see on camera, a very shiny watch. This has a much more, uh, I guess, blingy look to it than I think some of the Zenith watches did. Um, overall, it's just a phenomenal watch and uh, I'm really pleased that I get to call this one my own and share it with you people. And, Oh, and if you look on the back, there's a little bit left of the original hologram sticker that would have been on this watch. You can see a little bit of the crown, and it's a model number below it, 116520. However, this one apparently was worn a little bit by the previous owner. So, get a little bit of a wrist shot. I wear mine on my right wrist. There we go. And uh, just to touch again back on the rarity and collectability of these pieces, um, as I mentioned, there's been considerable wait lists for these type of watches. It, my understanding that authorized dealers get two a year. They get one black face and one white face. And those are the only two differences available, I believe, for the stainless steel Daytona. You can have a black face or a white face. Um, I personally looked at both, and I personally prefer the black dial. Um, right now, it's my understanding that Zenith movement watches, the earlier ones, they're actually quite collectible in stainless steel as they were so rare as well. Black dials seem to be selling at a premium compared to white dials. Um, the current one, this one using the 4130 in-house movement, I believe they're about equal on the used value market. However, um, so I was talking with a jeweler yesterday and he said the black dials seem to be in higher demand. I don't know that that's true, um, but uh, you do have the option of a white dial on this watch as well. And um, in terms of investments, um, I'm well under the impression that this will be a much better investment than the two-tone model, um, which is 116523, I believe. Um, I actually looked at a couple two-tones, and most of the two-tones that I looked at were selling at less, or selling at a lower price than the stainless steel, or they were selling at an equal price to the stainless steel. So, I mean, that said, if you're going to be in this market and to get into a Daytona, um, with the newer movement, I would say you're looking at at least 9000 and you're probably looking at more in the 12000 11 to $12,000 range for a stainless. Um, two tones are more about 8500 to 9000 um, in that range. Um, so if you do prefer a two-tone, you can also get a two-tone Daytona that looks just like this, except that the center links and the bezel would be in gold, 18 karat. And they do also make an all-gold model, but uh, I just can't see that as a daily wear watch, and they're considerably more expensive. Um, anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed the review. I, this is, as I said, I just received the watch today, so I wasn't really prepared to talk about it, but I really wanted to get it out there and share it. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them. And uh, thanks again for uh, watching this with me. And uh, let's go ahead and get the chronograph started again. As I'm uh, left-handed and wear it on my right wrist, it's not exactly made for someone like me with all the pushers on the right, but uh, here we go.